today we're going to talk about architectures in web development and software. We're going to be covering the most widely used pattern, which is MVC, Model View Controller. We'll be talking about component-based architectures, and we'll be talking about microservices, of course. And then we'll be talking about composite UI. So without further ado, let's just get right into it and see how each of these architectures build on each other and how they can help each other to create um, systems that work in a bunch of different ways with different pros and cons with every single system. Let's get into it. So let's say you want to build an app where you can keep track of all of your books. So you create an app, you create a project folder for it, and inside that you just write out your mega script. Now in programming languages like uh, say Python, PHP or Node, you can probably write a piece of code that's like 20 or 30 uh, lines of code long where you can enter some information about a book add it to a database, retrieve it, and show it in a table. So you can get your list with, with no more code than that. And that's fine. But just remember, when you're doing that, even if you separate it into a file where you have your database connection by itself and another file where maybe you create that table, you still don't have an architecture. It's not called an architecture just because you have a couple of different files with, uh, with a piece of responsibility each. In this case, you'll often end up with one thing that calls the other and, and just a mishmash of, of uh, what calls what. And when you build it up into multiple different files, you'll end up with something that's just not readable. So whenever you have to maintain this or change something, it's going to be uh, near impossible and it's going to take a long, long time to find the exact uh, functionality that you're looking for. And if you're working together with other people and you have 20, 30, 100 files like this, you're going to have an issue because it's just going to take way too long to maintain it. So that's why we use architectures. If you're just building something super small and you don't really need to need more than those like 20 or even 100 lines of code, then don't bother with an architecture. It doesn't matter. But as soon as you want to, to build something a little bit larger, you're going to have to, uh, to look at architecture. So let's say we rename this folder to presentation, then create another folder that's called business logic and a third folder that's called persistence. Then maybe we move these files around a little bit. So maybe we move the database connection over to the persistence folder. We move the mega script into the business logic and then we still have the create table um, inside of our presentation uh, folder here. So the idea is that the create table becomes something that that um, tells you everything about how the application should look and none of the other files actually do anything about that. Everything that has to do with how this application is going to look is going to be inside the presentation folder. And another rule for the presentation folder is that you cannot uh, have any business logic in here. The business logic folder contains everything that is, well, business logic. Um, so whenever you need to, to calculate something, do something, uh, check for access rights or whatever it might be, you're going to put that inside of your business logic folder. And then whenever you have something that concerns itself with data, you can put that into the persistence folder. What you have now is a simple architecture that's called the three layer architecture. Let's talk about it just a little bit more. See the presentation. Uh, layer, the folder that's called presentation, we call that the presentation layer, and it can only ever call the business logic layer. It can call any file inside of it, but it can only call that layer. The presentation layer must not be able to call the persistence layer directly. So whenever a user initiates something from the user interface, the user interface should have some code in it that can call the business logic layer. The business logic layer will then figure out what data it needs and get that from the persistence layer in one way or another. There are different ways to work with data, of course, but we'll get back to that in a second. So the data is going to be returned from the persistence layer to the business logic, and maybe it needs to be manipulated. Maybe it needs to be presented in a special way. Uh, before it's sent back into the presentation layer where it's shown to the user. Now, this is a great way to start separating your concerns because generally you'll, you'll be able to tell a front-end developer that you only have to concern yourself with the code in the presentation layer and you'll be able to tell a database developer to only concern themselves with the, with the code in the persistence layer. 
and a backend developer could generally uh, try to only mess with the code in the business logic layer. But um, this is a very loose architecture. It just sets up a couple of guidelines to get you started with architecture. So it doesn't really define how the presentation layer talks to the business logic layer. Do we have just one file in the presentation layer that's responsible for communicating with the business logic? Or do we just have one file in the business logic layer that's responsible for talking with the presentation layer? I've seen a bunch of different implementations of this, and you know some of them are good and some of them are not, but one thing I can say is they're not that similar. A big point of contention about this is the persistence layer. What exactly is the persistence layer? Because uh, right now, I added a file to it called database connection. But in a lot of systems like this, you're going to have um, you're going to have classes in your object oriented application that have the exact same fields as tables in your database. So those classes, do they go into the business logic layer or do they go into the persistence layer? You can argue for each of them. You can say that your persistence layer is about actually persisting the data, which is what you have the database connection for, what you have the database for. And so these uh, and these uh, objects that, that that have data in them, they don't persist the data, so they don't belong in the persistence layer. You could also say that, well, the database connection, that's like one file that that contains the actual logic that takes the data from the database and adds it into some objects in your OOP application. So maybe those uh, those um, objects belong in the persistence layer or the classes that you have with your data classes, they belong in the persistence layer and the database connection is just a functionality that make them work. So you can go either way and people do go both ways. So if you look this up online, you'll find you will be able to find large groups of people who believe that it should be one way or the other. That's not really defined in a three layer architecture. Of course, there is a, another option, which is to just say there's four layers then, right? But you can keep going then. How many layers is it exactly that you want? The idea with the separation of concerns here and separation of concerns is at the heart of every single architecture out there. And the idea with that is here we can take three different types of developers and we can send them to a folder each and they won't ruin anything for each other. So let's move on a bit and say, what can we do to build on top of this, to build on top of this three layer architecture? Well, we could take our presentation folder and call it a view folder. We could take our, um, our business logic folder and call it the controller folder. And we could take our um, our persistence folder and call it the uh, the model folder. And then inside the controller folder, we can add something like a user controller. We can make a, a user model and we can make a user profile as, as some form of a view for a user. And you can imagine that, that now we can add uh, other controllers to it. So we add the book controller here. We add a book search view and we add a book as a model as well. So this is what we call the model view controller or MVC. Now I'm drawing a couple of lines here to show you that the, um, the first green arrow that goes down into the user controller, that's to show you that, that a user who calls your MVC application will generally uh, start looking at a controller. Now, what controller do they look at? Which function do they call inside that controller? That's all controlled by a router. And a router can come in multiple different forms. Sometimes you have an actual file where you just have an array where it says, if this is the URL, then this is the controller and the function that you're going to call. You can do something with reflection where you just say that, well, take the first, uh, take the first word of the URL after the, uh, after the domain, then you just take uh, forward slash the first word. If that's user, you go for the user controller. If it's book, you go for the book controller. And then after the next slash, if the next word is going to be indexed, then you go for the index function. If the next word, word, word is a profile, then you go for the profile function. So that would be a reflection based router. Uh, a third way to do it is to actually annotate your controllers and say inside for my user controller, I can define that, well, this function that I'm building right now is going to be called when someone uses a get request or a post request or whatever it is to the endpoint that's called forward slash user forward slash controller. 
And that way we don't need to have a physical controller. We just need to have, have an application that reads these annotations. The idea then in model view controller, much like the three layer architecture is that, um, that only the center layer, the controller layer has access to the other layers. So the view can never access a model directly and a, uh, and the model cannot access a view either. So you call a controller, and that controller will then pick up some data from some models and the user controller can get data from the book model as, as well if it wants to. It can get it from all of the all of the models and then it can pass on whenever it's found all of the data that it knows is necessary to populate that user profile view, it can send the data over there. And then the user profile view is gonna know what to do with this data, how to present it, and that's what a view is for. And then that view is sent back to the user or to the client who who asked um, to see something by calling the controller in the first place or by calling the router actually. And that's the way that MVC works. So you have this separation of concerns, much like you had in the three layer architecture. And as a matter of fact, you could argue that the model view controller is a three layer architecture, but that doesn't mean that a three layer architecture is MVC. That's a really important distinction to make. So. Uh, when you do MVC, you can run into other uh, folders or other uh, structures than this. Uh, the most common one is probably the service because the controller here is not quite business logic like we saw it in the three layer model. Um, the controller is primarily here to orchestrate how everything fits together. So, so in a lot of cases, all you really need to do whenever someone reaches an endpoint or an address in their browser is just to figure out what data they want to see and how it should look when they see it. Uh, maybe you need to, to check if people are locked in and so on and so forth, but you can check that from the controller by you know, using the user controller. That's probably uh, something that would be in there. Um, but what then, when you want to do something that's not that? What if I have a user who comes to my website and say, oh, I want to log in, but using Facebook. Oh, but that means that I need to use another system. Should I do something in my user controller to integrate into Facebook? No, it would look weird if you had some, some file that primarily just orchestrates what comes from where and what goes where. And then all of a sudden you start, you start building all the, the logic that goes into uh, calling a different service and getting the, the JSON responses and traversing through it and all of that. No, 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 that belongs in a service. So whenever you have something where you integrate to another uh, application, you'll use a service for it. If you have to, in, uh, to implement some kind of complex algorithm, you'll use a service for that as well. Since MVC is by far the most uh, widely used architecture in web applications today, um, you will find a bunch of different implementations of it. And that also means that you'll often find things that have more entities than just the four that we mentioned. It, it doesn't necessarily only have controllers, views, models, and services. Sometimes you'll find something called a, um, a, uh, a view model. And that doesn't mean um, that the views now have access directly to the models or anything. No, it means that you have a model that directly reflects the data that a specific view needs. Uh, you can also have something called a repository. Um, and when we talk about repositories, it's important to, to talk about the way that we normally talk about uh, models because the models often reflect a table in the database, more or less one-to-one, -one, right? And, and when they do that, we want the data inside the model to look as if it came from the database, but without writing SQL code all the time. And the way that we achieve that is often by using an ORM, an object relational mapper. So, so what that does is that it automatically makes all those SQL calls in the background so that our objects always reflect the data that's in the database. So that's a beautiful, beautiful thing to have. But what do we do then when we need to have some complex structure with 48 joints or whatever we can, we can um, walk around and do in our, in our application code? Well, um, we can create a file still where we can have some SQL code in. But if we've implemented all of this in a way where our models don't have SQL code in them, 
uh, because we're using an ORM, we'll use a different folder to to uh, actually have our SQL code, code in, and that's going to be our repository. So that's just going to be that SQL code repository. So I think those are the primary things that you're going to see when you work with MVC applications. I have a whole video on my channel where, where I go through uh, an MVC template that you can also download from my GitHub. It's in PHP, uh, but it's easy enough to figure out, I, I think, uh, if you just watch the video, even if you're not that familiar with PHP. So go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, if you want to know more about MVC, it is definitely the one design pattern that you need to know. Uh, and as we go through the remaining design patterns in this video, you'll probably see why. Because if we move into the next design pattern here, let's say that we have this view controller model, that's our separation of concerns, so that we can have our front-end developers and our database developers and our back-end developers work in a folder each. Well, what if we didn't want to separate things that way. What if we wanted to separate it the other way and say, no, but I want my user component. I want my book component because it's great and all that I can have my database guy only go into one folder, but I'm a full stack developer. I can work with the database. I can work with the front end and I can work with the back end. Uh, it, it's not that complex for a, for a full stack developer. Uh, and sometimes you just work in small teams. Sometimes you might even need to build something yourself that still has a certain scale and that you want to do something with, right? So you need the architecture for it. But it becomes annoying to have to, to work in, in, in three, four, five, maybe six different folders uh, just to work with a simple thing. And, and when you're working across programming languages, maybe that's not the separation of concerns that you're looking for. Maybe the separation is rather... I want to work on users right now. So maybe just let me open up the user folder. And in there, I can take a look at everything that has to do with the users. That's going to be a user component. Now, inside of a, of a component, uh, if you build an app like this that has multiple components, you'll probably have some files in, in the app itself that allows you to work with the components. The idea for these components is that they're so self, uh, self-efficient that they don't really depend on other components. Now, there are of course use cases where they need to depend on other components and a user component is a really good example of that because most, um, most applications will have some kind of a user system. And if the user system is, um, is the authority when it comes to authentication uh, and authorization, well, then it would make sense for all the other components to just uh, expect that user component to always be there. I mean, if that's the case in nine out of 10 cases, then that is the norm and, and not an exception. Whereas the books here, well, they're maybe specific for this book app. So other components that depend on that book uh, component existing, they will not be uh, capable of existing on their own later on. Um, so, so that's the idea with the components, really, that a component can just be dropped into an application and work. Um, in some, uh, in, in some ways, if you use the right design patterns, you can build this in a way where you can just drop a component into a folder of an application that's already running, and it'll just be part of the, uh, of the running application, and you can remove it again, and it'll just disappear from the application. You can do things like that because that whole component is, uh, self-contained uh, so it still relies on the actual application around it in order to run it's not it's more uh, a cog in a machine than it is a um, than it is a full-blown machine the full-blown machine is is the actual app so the yellow book app in this example um, but if you have a lot of apps that work with similar data or use similar uh, functionality it makes a lot of sense to use a, com uh, a component-based architecture. So you can use the same core application for everything. You can use the components that you need every single time. So if you always need a user, user component, you can just import that user component into, into every version of your app and then build those, those uh, minor extra functionalities that you need in a specific app somewhere. So once again, this is called a component-based architecture. And when we do this, well, we start by calling a controller still, 
the controller calls the model and well, we can call the core and through the core, we can call other components or the core can call other components if they exist. You will often use something like a publish subscribe pattern in order to achieve something like this um, and avoid a situation where the uh, components become truly dependent on each other. But you can call the core and you can always expect the core to exist and it may or may not return something depending on what exists in the system. At the end, you're gonna um, push something to the uh, to the view and send something back to to um, to the client that asked for whatever it was that was asked for. But this is why I mentioned that MBC is such an important um, architecture to know because even when you have a, a, a component-based architecture, you might, there's, there's no rule for it, but you might still be using MVC inside of it. So inside your user component, you're gonna have your user controller, model, and view possibly a user service, possibly multiple user services, but everything that has to do with those users and can be contained inside of this self-contained component, well, it's just right there inside of that folder that you can just copy paste into every single application that you want. So that's how it looks when you combine a component-based architecture with MVC and model view controllers. But let's try and take it one step further because Right now, we're, we're actually creating something where we can take a little bit of functionality and we can move it around a little bit more freely because we have it combined uh, instead of having it spread across folders uh, uh, just in order to please some developers, right? So if we start separating things just a little bit, we, we move these components away and we um, then take a look at these apps. We could separate this into two apps, you know, instead of being two components in the same app, it could just be two apps. And this is what we call microservices. So now instead of just having one book app, we have, well, it says book app and book app, but the idea is of course that the top uh, half of the book app is actually a, a user service that has all this stuff in it. We're still using the MBC uh, C design pattern here inside of the microservice. And once again, no one says that you have to use MVC inside of a microservice but often you'll find that you do, uh, that, that you end up doing that. Um, because it, it still makes sense to separate your, um, your, pro, your files like that when you're programming. And it still makes sense to use the most widely used architectures because the whole point of an architecture is to make it easy for every other developer to find their way around the stuff that you're doing. So, so that, that's why we, I generally suggest that you use MVC whenever you can. But now we've actually separated this into two different applications. So we have the book app and then we have a part of the book app that we've taken out into a microservice that maybe we call that the uh, the user app or the user service. And the beauty of that is that now our book app can use that user service um, and Another app, if we want to make a movie app, that movie app can use the same user service. Uh, and we don't have to, to copy, copy paste it around because it is just that one single thing that exists in the middle and we can tie things up to it and, and everything that we want. And one of the major benefits of using microservices like this is that we can scale our resources um, almost infinitely. So if we have... Um, a user system. Let's say we have a login system like, like uh, Microsoft have their login system. Could you imagine how many people log in with Microsoft login system every single second? Well, since it's its own service, uh, they can just scale up the resources for it. And as a matter of fact, they can probably just spin up multiple machines that all run the same service. So if you try to keep your microservices uh, as stateless as possible, you're going to do yourself a huge favor because if you make sure to test your application that it's capable of running two instances or multiple instances of the same application without ever running into problems because you're using the same database behind it, then you're going to be able to, to scale how many uh, instances of the same application you're running at any given time. And just to, re <laughs> to, to mention it, one more time, it's still a good idea. It's not required, but it's still a good idea to use MVC and start of your microservice. Now, 
One last thing I should say about microservices is that um, not all microservices need to have a database. Sometimes you can have multiple microservices that share the same database. Sometimes you can have um, uh, microservices that don't use a database at all. And sometimes, of course, they have their own database. And it's also completely normal for a microservice not to have a front end at all. So uh, if this is something that you just use for authorization, authentication, or or to provide a list of data or whatever it is, it's completely fine to just have a controller and a model and just return some data to other services, which then have uh, views. Um, and, and like in the component-based architecture, um, there's nothing to say that, that an, an application or a microservice cannot be dependent on something else. It's completely normal in enterprise uh, um, organizations or in, in government organizations where you have a lot of different microservices that you still need a, a common way to access them all. And so you build some kind of an integration platform or, or integration service that allows you to interact with a bunch of different services. Uh, and you can still scale them up and down using something like Kubernetes to always decide how many instances of a microservice should be running at any given time. Uh, and you can get a bunch of other benefits from that. But it is, of course, also a more complex setup. So this is something that you want to do if it's important that all of these services keep running at all times, uh, that you can scale your application and, and, of course, that you can keep a common size. Now, a common pitfall when it comes to microservices is to lean too much on the part of the word that says micro and just try to make your microservices as small as possible. Because that also means that you have more applications to run and run maintenance on. And even though it, it might be easier to find your way around things when they're separated into their own code repositories and they run as their own things, a team of people will generally be overwhelmed if they are told that they have the responsibility for 10 different apps rather than you know three or four. So there, there's a, a real balance to be struck here to make sure that you make your, um, your applications big enough that they provide significant value and that they have uh, their own reason for existing, but also small enough that you don't end up with these big monolith applications where you have to scale a giant application just because there's a small part of it that's being used by a lot of people. So I want to cover one more thing that you can do uh, still with microservices and build on top of that. So we had this book app, right? But what if we move the book app away here and then, uh, and then said that we had these two microservices, right? So we had the book microservice and the user microservice. And then we have a third one here to the left, um, which only has the view in it. So the idea here is that we have one application on the left, and, and I apologize for the uh, <laughs> for the lack of uh, complete separation here. But the idea is that that the views are in an app of their uh, <laughs> are in an app of their own. So we have a uh, a app called Composite UI where we just have all of the views for all of our microservices. Then our microservices only ever have controllers and uh, and models. They might have services, they might have repositories, all the other things we discussed in in MVC. Um, and, you know, like we talked about in microservices, they might not all have models. So some of them might just be a, a controller. Or they'll probably have a service or something, but, but some of them can be really simple. Some of them can be really complex. But everything that has to do with the front end just lives inside that composite UI. Now, there are two different ways of making these front-end components for a composite UI. Um, you can either just build your composite UI so that it has components in it that reflect what you want to show for each of the services that you're building your user interface for. Or you can... Um, um, or you can say that each of the uh, microservices are responsible for providing a user interface still, but instead of providing a whole user interface, they'll just have to provide the user interface for the component that they represent. So that's the idea of Composite UI, that you have one front-end application that has a bunch of components in it that it can use whenever it, it needs to um, communicate or show something, present something even, 
from a microservice somewhere, and then it can combine that. I think a really good example for that is if you go into Amazon's website, uh, you can see the, the search bar up top. That's a whole component in and of itself. That's a microservice, definitely. And and it's just a composite UI that allows that to be on all of the pages. Then on the left, you have all of your filters and you have your search results. Uh, then you have your product pages. And if you go into a product page, then you have recommendations at the bottom. Those are all different uh, microservices that have a common UI that's put together using composite UI. So I hope this gives you a good idea of when and how to use each of these different uh, design patterns. And uh, just to walk through it one last time without all of the uh, fancy animations, let's just take them from the top. If you want to build a small and simple application, don't bother with a design pattern at all. If you just want something where you can list all of your books and always retrieve that list, if you want to build a simple to-do list just for yourself to run on your own computer, just do it with the least amount of code possible. Just use Python or PHP or something that can easily access your database and, and take things out of it and, and do something pretty visual with very little code. Um, that's just more time efficient. And that's pretty much what it comes down to at the end of the day. So if you want to build something a little bit bigger and perhaps you need to be more than one developer on it and people need a um, an intuitive way of figuring out what goes where, maybe, maybe start thinking about using a three layer architecture. So at least you know what's the visual part and what's the persistence part and what is then just the logic. And if you're doing it in a, in a web environment, then it almost always makes sense to use a specific three layer model that's called MVC, uh, primarily just because it's the most widely used. And there is really good reason to do what everyone else is doing. And that is when you scale your, uh, let, let's say you're just sitting here by yourself and you have the greatest idea ever and you cannot really decide if you're going to use MVC. Think about it like this. If, um, if your idea really is the best idea ever and you're going to end up scaling this, getting other people to, to try and work with you on the software that you're building, MVC is the most widely used architecture. It'll be easy for you to find developers who know how the things you're working with work. So uh, if you come up with your own uh, design pattern to do something completely new and different, uh, maybe it's not that easy. But at some point, you might run in, into the problem, you know, that, that you try to separate concerns by having your models and your views and your control and your services um, in different folders, but you're, you're building something that's turning into a bit of a monolith. And there's actually nothing wrong with building big applications. There's always this balance to be struck between what it is that we're building, right? We shouldn't divide things into multiple applications just for the sake of doing so. It should be meaningful. So sometimes we need to actually build big applications. But but how do we then do that when, uh, when we open up our controllers folder and we have like 40 controllers? there's still not a really good separation of concerns. Yeah, sure, we know where the, where the backend developers should go. We know where the database developers should go. But other than that, we're not really, we're not really helped by the architecture. And it's still going to get a little bit uh, difficult to find your way around things. And so the answer often is components. And especially because if you have an application that's that big, well, maybe you have other applications in the organization as well. And even if you don't, Maybe you plan to get more applications at a later point. And maybe you'll even want to transition into microservices at some point because you realize that the monolith you're building is starting to become problematic. Maybe it's becoming so big that you need to, to take it down for multiple hours before you can spin up a new version or something. There might be several different reasons why you need to go over into a microservice architecture. And if you're going in that direction, then starting by going out into the component-based architecture is actually a really great step on the way because it'll make it easier to figure out what the microservices could be. And once you're ready to take that step, sometimes you can just create that microservice by copying the core and only popping the components into that version of the core that you need for one microservice and then build another microservice by making another copy of the core with, uh, with some other uh, components in it. And some of the components will probably live in most of, if not all of your microservices, uh, like like the user component often does, right? 
unless of course the user component is is becoming a user service. Um, so try to think of it like that, right? To say small application, something that I just need to build myself needs to be ready tomorrow. Let's just go ahead and, and write something with no architecture. I need to collaborate with a couple of people on a project. Let's do a three-layer architecture. I want to build something a little bit bigger, something that I might be developing on a year from now, uh, that multiple people might be developing on a year from now. Go with MVC. If you're building something that's getting huge or that you might want to split into multiple applications or something that have has uh, some functionality that, um, that you want to uh, use across different applications, go with a component-based uh, architecture. And if you want to to have functionality that is exactly the same across applications always and and where you know the state of things well it shouldn't be stateful in a microservice if you can avoid it but you want to be able to scale some things and you need to just have have a service running rather than copying things around between applications every single time well then microservices is the way to go that's when you go with a microservice um, and if you have a lot of different microservices and you need a common way to access them all through a user interface, then you have something like Composite UI that'll help you define um, components, visual components that will correspond to the microservices that you have. And of course, a microservice can be big or it can be small, and it can have a lot of um, components for your Composite UI, or it can have a few or maybe even none. And Inside of a microservice, you might find a component-based architecture, and each component inside that component-based architecture in your microservice might use an MVC design, pa uh, <laughs> design pattern. Well, it's more of an architecture than it is a design pattern, but still. Um, so all of these things really fit together, and they build on each other. And how much of this you should use really depends on the scale of the application. If you're building huge scale software, use all of it. And the smaller it is, the further down the ladder you can go. So I hope that gives you a, a good insight into the different architectures that you would generally use in web-based applications, when to use them, when not to use them, and what the benefits are of each. And with all that said, I hope you had a good time and I'll see you in the next video. Remember to check out my MVC video because as you've probably seen now, that is by far the most um, the most widely used design pattern. So learning a little bit more about that is only going to be helpful. And it has a real life code example in it. And even if you don't want to work with PHP, I think it's pretty easy for, for most people to just translate the, the template that you can just get on GitHub into something in the programming language of your choice. Uh, at least you can see the concepts and how it's put together. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining and I'll see you. Bye bye.